الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد المعترفين بأنعمه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد يا ربنا أنت خالق السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد يا ربنا أنت قيوم السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد يا ربنا أنت الحق ووعدك حق وقرآنك حق ورسولك حق والجنة حق والنار حق لك الحمد يا ربنا كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك جل وجهك وعز جاهك تفعل ما تشاء يا رب بقدرتك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endless is in his glory the creator of heavens and earth the provider, the cherisher the sustainer, the source of all good. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that He has granted me and my loved ones and I ask Allah to extend those blessings and to increase them and to perpetuate them. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us deserving of His blessings. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds however little they might be and to forgive our sins however major and great they might be. I bear witness that there is no deity in this universe worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon him, his family, his companions, and all the righteous men and women that walk in their footsteps. And I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them, Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A little over a year ago, I had the great opportunity and the great blessing to counsel one of the sisters over a few sessions. And that experience did really change my life in so many different ways. Uh, that sister was in her mid 30s, she was uh, struggling with terminal illness, she had cancer. And she was grappling with the meanings of life and purpose in God and why she has to endure and stand such a severe trial and tribulation. And in the course of my counseling with this sister, and I really did my best, sometimes imams really are not equipped to, to work with people who, are, who have you know, severe mental health issues because of their illness and their disease. And, and she was working with a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a counselor and everything. But she needed some spiritual guidance, you know, why is this happening to me? Why am I losing my life, you know, in my mid-30s when I haven't achieved anything? I got married, but I don't even have children. I didn't get to enjoy things in, in life. Why is God doing this to me, right? Imagine having, having to work with someone that is basically awaiting the impending uh, uh, inevitable fact that, that they will die soon. So I worked with her on a few sessions, and in one of the sessions she told me about pain. We spoke about pain a little bit. And I thought that when she talked about pain that she primarily meant physical pain because of her cancer. And then she told me, my physical pain I can handle when I'm taking my painkillers on a regular basis. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is the pain in my heart. So I said, why is there pain in your heart? You know, I, of course, I know why is there, there's pain in her heart, but I'm trying to have a conversation with her. Tell me about the pain in your heart. And she says to me, the pain in my heart primarily comes because I am not able to forgive my parents. So I, I was really astonished. And I asked her, what, what's going on with your parents? Why are you not able to forgive your parents? And she said, I have not made contact with my parents and they have not made contact with me for the last 15 years. I was like, oh my God, this is astounding to me. Your parents live in town? And she said, yeah, they live about 15 minutes away. And I asked her, tell me the story. You know, why is it that you're not making contact with your parents? And she said, about 20 years ago, my parents wanted me to marry someone. We arranged the marriage entirely. 
And initially I went along with it, but I realized that this was a really horrible person with, with a history of um, sexual abuse. That he has inflicted sexual abuse upon other people and he was accused of it multiple times. And I said, I'm not going to live my life with someone like this. And my parents insisted that I marry him, despite everything I presented to them, despite all the facts that I showed them, they insisted that I still marry this person. So I told her, so what, what did you do? She said, I, I eventually left the house. And my parents were so hurt and offended by that, and they said, you brought disgrace upon our family, and we will never be able to raise our heads again in the community. And over the next five years, she tried to connect with her parents and to get her parents to forgive her. And they would not even give her a single gesture of forgiveness. And they did not even talk to her. Five years later, she gave up completely on trying to make contact with her parents. And that went on for 15 years. Mom and dad, who are still alive, who refrain from making contact with her own daughter because she refused to marry the man that they forced her to marry, which is against Islam anyway. Marriage has to be consensual. I always say to parents, arranged marriages where you're forcing your son or you're forcing your daughter to be in a relationship is not even halal. You know, it's like you're putting them in, in, in a zina relationship because their marriage is invalid, right? But sometimes, you know, and I've noticed this over the course of my career, sometimes cultural practices matter more to people than God, than Islam, than faith, than right and wrong, than logic. And it matters more to them than the very value of the human being. Upholding the cultural practices matters more to them than, than the life of their own daughter. They heard, and, and, and you know, you'll be shocked to hear this, they knew that their daughter has cancer. And you know what their response was? Their response was to contact the Muslim cemetery to make sure to tell the Imam over there, if our daughter died, don't bury her there because she's not Muslim. Can you believe the level of, of hatred can, can reach, you know, that extent? When, when you are so offended that your daughter did not obey you to marry someone that you selected for her. I mean, when we get married, we want and need our parents to be involved. There is absolutely no marriage in this world that would be sustainable and beautiful without the consent of our parents. Let me put it that way. The Western thing, oh, I fell in love and I'm going to marry this person against everyone's will. In, in, in the real world, it doesn't work. Because we need our parents and we need our family and we need our community. And we need aunts and uncles and cousins in the lives of our children. So we work with our parents and we try to get them to consent or try to see the world through their view. Right? And so the other extreme is just as bad. And we need our parents to be involved in the process of selecting a spouse. But parents should never give themselves the right to tell their children, you marry this person if I tell you. And you cannot marry that person if I tell you. It doesn't work that way. There's a process. It's a negotiation. It's a discussion. It's a conversation that may take months. But we put the effort and the time that we need to put in order to actually get it done. And then it was the month of the Hijjah of last year. So about a year from, from, from today, a little less than a year from today, a year ago. And I gave a khutbah about Dhul Hijjah. I don't even remember what I said in the khutbah. And a few, a few days later, maybe we can go to YouTube and check. A few days later, that sister came to me with a bright face, happy attitude, still tears in her eyes, but she was very, very different. And I asked her, well, you look better today. What's going on? She said, Alhamdulillah, I finally managed to forgive my parents. And I was really astounded and I said, SubhanAllah, you know, tell me, what, 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 how, how did it happen? What really did the trick for you? And she said, it's something that you said in the khutbah last Friday. You said in the context of the month of the Hijjah and the first 10 days of the Hijjah, which will start, by the way, this coming Sunday or Monday, I said, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ أَحَبُّ فِيهِنَّ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ There's no other days in the calendar year in which good deeds are more loved by Allah than good deeds in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. So I was like, okay, I, I may have said that. I probably said that because that's the hadith that we always cite when we talk about the month of the Hijjah. So I said, but how did that do the trick to you? She said, I said to myself, 
if the month of the Hijjah started and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us to do good deeds, I chose that my good deed will be to forgive my parents. And that sister, brothers and sisters, died about a month ago. And her parents did not attend her funeral. You know when you insist on your, on your falsehood until the very end? When you insist on your falsehood until the very end to the extent that you don't even attend your daughter's funeral. But with, with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she was buried at the Muslim cemetery. And, and the imams were there. And, and nobody listened to what her parents had to say in the course of the process. I remember her today because she taught me a life lesson that I will never forget. And that is, however much we think of acts of worship as fasting and prayer and reading the Quran and dhikr, this sister taught me that acts of worship, good deeds, al-amal as-salih, as in the hadith, is expanded and extended to so many beautiful things that we can do in life, including acts of the heart, such as forgiveness, which in my point of view, is a lot more difficult than praying two rak'ahs or reading five pages of the Quran. You ask yourselves right now, if you're holding a grudge against someone, how easy is it to just forgive that person and let it go? And when you see that person next time, you just smile in their face and you hold absolutely no anger in your heart against them. It's pretty, pretty tough, isn't it? It's very tough. It's a lot more difficult than praying two rak'ahs. It's a lot more difficult than fasting a day, right? That sister taught me that the, the taking the moral high ground is, is such a noble and honorable and beautiful thing to do. And she died honorably. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed hatred and anger and resentment from her heart and she was able to forgive. And perhaps that simple act of forgiveness at the end of her life will grant her the Jannah of Allah Azza wa And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she's in Jannah right now as we speak, right? And the month of the Hijjah is about to start. And when I was going through my notes last week and I remembered that sister, I said that I needed to honor her and talk about her a little bit today. When I talk about the month of the Hijjah, when I talk about the 10 days that are about to start, this coming Sunday or Monday, depending on, on the moon, is going to be the, the beginning of the first 10 days of the Hijjah the most beautiful and most noble of days in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَحَبُّ الْأَيَّامِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَيَّامُ الْأَضْحَى The best of days and most loved of days by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the first 10 days of the Hijjah starting inshallah ta'ala this weekend. And I am reminded of the ayah in the Quran that you may have heard before. Because the first 10 days of the Hijjah are the first 10 days of one of the sacred months of the year, right? Al-Ashur al hur What are, by the way, what are the sacred months of the year? I always go through this exercise every year to make sure that we are connected with our history, that we are connected with our heritage, heritage and the knowledge of our own deen. Is Ramadan in, in, the, in the four months? It's not. Ramadan is a beautiful month in its own right, but it is not one of the four sacred months of the calendar year, right? Rajab, which comes before Sha'ban and Ramadan, is one of them. And then this is an easy way to memorize it. Rajab is by itself, and the three other months are, you know, consecutive. Dhul Qi'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Al Muharram, the very first month of the year. So the last two, and the first one, and Rajab is by itself. These are the four sacred months in the Islamic calendar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes this in the Quran for you that might say, well, you know, this is... This is like 1,400 years ago. Who cares about this knowledge anymore? Well, here's why you should care. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Ya Allah, it's a big deal. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the count of, of months in the year, in the sight of Allah, in, in his own book, on the day he created heavens and earth, it was assigned and decided, is going to be 12. The assignment of the 12 months of the year is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided on when he was creating, creating heavens and earth. 
And he said that four of them will be sacred. Four of them shall be sacred in your eyes, meaning you need to restrict vain talk, restrict wasting your time, restrict arguing with other people, certainly restrict fighting, you know, particularly using violence, right? Responding with profane words to attackers. All acts of aggression should be completely suppressed in those four months. Perhaps it'll teach you how to live like that the rest of the year. But there are two words here that I wanted to emphasize. One of them is ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ What is deen, by the way? We always say, I follow the deen. What, what, is, what does the word deen mean? Deen means path, essentially. And when I say I want to follow the deen, it means I would like to follow the path of Islam. So it's a metaphor. Deen. So it says, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ Understanding the four sacred months. Understanding the value of Dhul-Hijjah. Doing good deeds in the month of Dhul-Hijjah and refraining from acts of aggression in the month of Dhul-Hijjah and other sacred months. Allah says, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ This indeed is the path that will help you sustain and maintain and establish everything else in your life. See, I had to use like a very long sentence to ex explain only one Arabic word. One of our greatest scholars, Imam ibn al-Qayyim. Why did they call him Imam ibn al-Qayyim? Because his father was the custodian of a school. It was called al jawziya school. So they call him Ibn Qayyim al jawziya He is the son of the custodian of al jawziya school. That's the meaning of Ibn Al-Qayyim. So the word Qayyim means to be a custodian of something, to be the maintainer of something, to establish something and keep it, and upkeep it. So when the ayah says, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ Qayyim, This particular behavior of observing the sacred months, observing the month of Dhul-Hijjah, observing the 10 days, being vigilant and keeping an eye out for all the beautiful seasons of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what is going to sustain and maintain your life. It's what's going to establish your moral compass. It's what's going to give meaning and lend meaning and purpose to your existence. It is like that sister, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept her in the highest level of Jannah. The last few days of her life, she chose to establish a moral compass and she made a decision accordingly and she died in a beautiful state of forgiveness. So when you observe and read about and, and try to observe the next, the 10 days of the Hijjah, you are basically establishing and maintaining a value in your life, a meaning and a purpose in your life, right? The other word that I wanted to comment on is فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not Commit injustice against yourselves in those days. How do we commit injustice against ourselves? And how do we hurt ourselves? By not worshipping Allah properly. By not maintaining our daily prayers. By not reading the Quran. By, by not forgiving each other. Right? By committing sins and making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry. Right? And how do we establish those 10 days? Right? The acts of worship. You know, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar... Uh, says that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast the nine days. Can we fast on the tenth day, by the way? We can't. Because the tenth day is what? It's the day of Eid. The tenth day is the day of Eid al-Adha. So we cannot fast on the, ten, on the tenth day. And the ninth day is which day? It's the day of Arafah. I'll talk about that in a second. So fasting on the first nine days is Sunnah. Making Qiyamul Layl on the first ten days is Sunnah. Giving sadaqah every single day is sunnah. Reading the Qur'an is sunnah. Making dhikr is sunnah. But holding your mother's hands and kissing her is also sunnah in those days. Acts of kindness, right? Obeying your parents on those days is sunnah. Being involved in the chores of the house for the young people around here is sunnah. Taking all the old clothes that have been, been sitting in, in, in the closet for so long and giving them, donating them to the homeless is going to be a beautiful act of worship. Amal salih in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. So don't waste your time in those days and, and get and engage in, in useless conversations and vain talk and watching a lot of TV and, and wasting time you know, on, on video games and stuff like that and social media. All of us are glued to our phones every minute of the day. This is how we hurt ourselves. In the days of the sacred months. فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you. Because I give you a gift and you squander the gift. That makes Allah so angry. 
I give you a chance to be forgiven and you cast it aside, that makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so angry. And speaking of Arafah, I mentioned it a couple of minutes ago. Arafah is such a powerful day. In fact, it's the most powerful day of the year. So you have the last 10 days of Ramadan and then you have the last 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, right? Which days are better? The last 10 days of Ramadan or the 10 days of Al Hijjah? But the consensus of the scholars and the Sahaba is that the first 10 days of the Hijjah are the best 10 days of the year. But what about the nights? What are the best 10 nights of the year? Those are the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Everyone knows that. What is the most important night in the last 10 nights of Ramadan? Laylatul Qadr. Everyone knows that. And what is the most important day in the first 10 days of the Hijjah? The day of Arafah, right? Do we know? When Laylatul Qadr exactly is? We don't. It's kind of obscure. But do we know when the day of Arafah is? Yes. We know exactly that it's the ninth day. And that's why the scholars used to say, The day of Arafah has been assigned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your benefit. So there's absolutely no confusion. The night of power, the Laylatul Qadr, has not been assigned. We don't know exactly which night it is. We can only guess. That's the power of the day of Arafah. And the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Siyamu Arafah, Yukaffiru Sanatan Madiya, Wa Sanatan Baqiya. Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad. Fasting on the day of Arafah is a forgiveness to the previous year and a forgiveness to the upcoming year. Ya Allah. How is that? How is that? And see, here's the thing. The Prophet ﷺ in, in other ahadith, he would say, oh, you know, fasting on this day is a great forgiveness. Except for major sins. But here, he didn't say that. He said, it will forgive all the sins in the previous year and the following year. And he didn't say a word, which means that it includes minor and major sins. What a season. What an open gate for forgiveness. So Allah, brothers and sisters, if you have committed a major sin, if you have committed zina, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you. If you've done something really horrible, and you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Arafah, and you fast on that day with sincerity, and you ask Allah for forgiveness, and you repent, all of it is wiped out. And someone might say, well, isn't that like Allah being way too lenient? And people might actually take advantage of that and exploit it and commit all kinds of sins and then just come fast on the day of Arafah and all, all is ready and all is good and all is forgiven. And the scholars said, no. Because it is only decent human beings that will take the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and would want to reciprocate. And if you are an, an indecent human being, you will not take advantage of it in the first place. You will likely just squander it and cast it aside. Even if we tell you there is a day on which, you know, if you fast, all of your sins will be forgiven. If you're an indecent human being, you still won't take advantage of that opportunity. Because you cannot just become decent on that day and indecent the rest of the year. And for the rest of us who are given the gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember what Allah says in the Quran. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الإحسان. Is there a better response for good than good? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does good to you. You do something else unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala less than good. That would be completely dishonorable. When I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for us to always be reminded by the blessings of this beautiful month. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds and to give us the strength to hustle and to exert effort in, in the 10 days of the hijjah to be forgiven. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands. Speak to Allah azza wa from the heart. Allah wa antum muqiluna bil ijabah. Alhamdulillahi wa nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu bihi wa nasta'hdihi wa nasta'ghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu fahuwa al-muhtadi wa man yudlil falan tajid lahu waliya murshida. وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters, as I said earlier, the month of the Hijjah is going to start إن شاء الله in either a day or two, so it's, it'll be either this Sunday or Monday. إن شاء الله we're going to be announcing that very soon. And the first 10 days of the Hijjah, as the Prophet taught us, وسلم, are 
some of the most sacred and some of the most important 10 days of the year in which you know, our good deeds are more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than any other time of the year. So a small act of kindness, a small act of charity in the, in the 10 days of the first 10 days of the Hijj are more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than much bigger acts of obedience and acts of kindness throughout the year. And I said that this is a season of new beginnings. And who wouldn't want a new beginning? A clean slate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You fast, and I'm not going to say fast, you know, all nine days, even though many of the companions used to fast them. It is actually reported that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast the nine days. You don't even have to do that. Fast maybe two or three days, and then fast on the day of Arafah with the intention of the previous year is forgiven, and inshallah ta'ala the upcoming year is forgiven as well. And speaking of new beginnings, I'm also aware that this week and next week, uh, inshallah ta'ala, many of the students in our community are going to be going back to school, right? Some are already back, back in their schools, but many inshallah will be going back to school while the first 10 days have already started. And I'm, I'm like, this is such a beautiful coincidence. It's such a beautiful opportunity. All the young people here, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, they're going back to school. Wallahi, it's such a beautiful opportunity and a beautiful coincidence that in the days of new beginnings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you a chance to a new beginning, you are basically starting school, which also gives you a chance to a new beginning. You know, if your grades were not doing great, you know, this is the time to improve and improve them and say, inshallah ta'ala, this year, mostly A's, maybe some B's, but inshallah ta'ala, mostly A's, and I need to really focus. And I know many of the students would say, well, you know, school is not just about academics, it's about a lot more than that. And I say, fine, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. School is about socializing, it's about making friends, it's about life skills, I get that. But make good choices. When you're starting school, make good choices. Socialize, but socialize with the right people. Make friends, but make good friends that will have an impact on you and will make you a better person. This is always a good litmus test, by the way, for me. When I know someone and I'm spending time with someone, I always ask myself, is that person making me better or making me worse? It's very simple. It's not about how they make me feel. I may laugh for five minutes, right? But is it making me a better person or a worse person in the long term? That's a very simple and easy test, right? Learn life skills, but learn useful life skills, right? The kiki challenge is not a good life skill, right? That is the epitome of stupidity and foolishness. We live in an age of trending subjects. Someone somewhere comes up with an idea and it goes viral. Everybody else feels that they're compelled to follow. Why? Why can't you be your own person and do your own things and follow your own values and keep your own moral compass and be a trend setter yourself? Why can't we make it a trend to do good at school? Why can we make it a trend to dress modestly in public? Why are we always a victim to somebody else's trend? Why are we not setting good and positive trends, right? Because we're not taking it seriously. So you're going to be going back to school. Make sure, inshallah ta'ala, that you start a new slate with yourself, with your family, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is going to be a good year. Say that from the heart. Wear your identity on your sleeve. Don't hide it. I am Muslim first and foremost. And that's who I am. And if my friends are okay with this, I'm okay with them. And if you have a problem with me being Muslim, you're not a good friend. You're out of my circle, period, done. Be as upfront about your identity when you go to school as possible. And let me leave you, inshallah, with this very quick tip, something beautiful and delightful to do in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, and, and Abu Huraira, they used to go to the marketplace and start saying Allahu Akbar. Both of them walking together, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Takbir. So everyone is like, what is wrong with these guys? You guys okay? So they would say, Takbir. So people would be like, Allahu Akbar. Because they're shy, you know. If, if Ibn Umar says Takbir, you have to say Allahu Akbar. So gradually people at the at, at, at city center, the marketplace, they started, every time they see Abu Huraira, and they see Abdullah ibn Umar, when it's the season of the Hijjah, they start, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, we know. So they asked him, you know, why, are we, why do we say Allahu Akbar on these days? He says, because these are the days to say Allahu Akbar. <laughs> 
say Allahu Akbar on these days. So if you're, if you're driving your car, the best, the, the best dhikr to make these days is, is Allahu Akbar. God is great. Allahu Akbar. Constantly. And, and the scholars taught us, you know, al-takbir al-muqayyad wa takbir ghayr al-muqayyad and all these things in the fiqh that you may have heard of. So there's forms of takbir that you can just recite and say anytime. The first 10 days, say Allahu Akbar anytime, anywhere. But then, and here's a beautiful sunnah, you know, takbir al-muqayyad. You know, it's a restricted type of takbir that, that you recite at a particular time. It's a beautiful thing. It's the only time of year where we do this. Starting from Salat al-Fajr on, on the nine, a ninth day, which is the day of Arafah, until Salat al-Asr on the 13th. So that's a little bit less than five days. So the day of Arafah, the first day of Eid, second, third, and fourth. This is five days. Starting from Fajr of the day of Arafah until Asr of the day of, uh, of the fourth day, right? Thalith ayam al-Tashriq. The fourth day of Eid, you always make takbir after every salah. I don't know if you've noticed, when we're at the masjid, right? So inshallah, next Friday when it's Jum'ah, it, you know, we, if it's, I don't, and I don't think it'll, it'll be the ninth day yet. So when it's the ninth day and you come to the masjid and it's Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, or Isha, whatever, right after you make the sleem, you do the takbir. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. This beautiful takbir that we say, you know, during Salatul Eid. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds on these beautiful days, to forgive our sins, to establish us firmly with His path, to always keep us connected with our heritage, with our faith, with our values and principles. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on all the young brothers and sisters in our community that are going to school, inshallah, these days. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them and to preserve them and to help them maintain their identity and to help them maintain their manners and to help them maintain their sanctity and their modesty, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them with success at all fronts this year. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day to accept us as His worshippers, to accept us in the upcoming days as His servants. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive others for theirs. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day to give us a charitable and gener generous natures in our hearts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Make us among those who will earn his blessings in this life and those who will be admitted to his Jannah on the Day of Judgment in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma laka alhamdu kama yinbaghi li jalali wajhi ka wa'adhim sultanik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. Taqabal minna innaka anta al-sameeu al-alim. Wa tuba alayna innaka anta al-tawabu al-rahim. Allahumma ahdina wa jalna hudatan mahdiyin. La dhalina wa la mudillin. Nuhibbu bihubbika man ahabbaka wa nuadi bi'adawatika man adak. تقبل منا طاعاتنا تقبل منا صالح أعمالنا في عشر ذي الحجة يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلنا من اعتقائك من النار واجعلنا من المقبولين اللهم انصر إخواننا المصلعفين في المشارق والمغارب يا رب العالمين أبدلهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا يعبدونك لا يشركون بك شيئا اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا